Our guest tonight, Dr. Hussein Baga, is a consultant, a physician, and also a nephrologist, and um, is here to talk to us about COVID with a specific bias on kidney. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Thank you for having me. For honoring our invitation. And um, we, 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 as a country, we've gone through the first wave, we've gone through the second wave, we've gone through the third wave, and now let's talk about the fourth wave. And my first question, as your opening remarks, is are we winning this brutal battle on COVID-19? Well, currently as we speak, um, the numbers are quite high, um, especially in Nairobi, the hospitals are being overwhelmed. Um, every day we, at the MP Shah Hospital, have to transfer a couple of patients to ICUs, so we have to look for ICU beds, which are quite scarce in our country. Mm -hmm. So right now, I think we're still grappling with it. I don't think we're winning the war as yet. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be responsible citizens. I mean, the onus is upon us. We can't always blame other people for our own uh, behaviors. So my humble appeal to everybody is just uh, wear a mask all the time mm -hmm. when you're out, social distancing mm -hmm. and hygiene. Hand hygiene is very important mm -hmm. when so it comes to prevention. So a lot of emphasis on the protocols that have been fronted by the ministry, yes. ministry of health. But, but, but even as we are seeing that surge and that spike in the Delta vi variant. What would you tell our viewers? How would you describe this variant called the Delta? How serious is it? So the Delta variant currently is the most predominant variant in most of the countries in the world. Um, the, the, the reason why it's become very important is that it is highly infectious. Mm -hmm. It is more infectious than the Lambda variant that was initial variant. Mm -hmm. Um, we are now seeing that it is causing more severe disease mm -hmm. than the previous variant as well. And now currently in Kenya we are seeing the younger population getting the more severe disease. Mm -hmm. So we really need to be careful mm -hmm. currently as we speak. Because I remember previously we were, there was a lot of emphasis that was placed on uh, people with comorbidities and the elder demographic. But yes. today we are seeing younger and younger patients yes. showing up with uh, COVID-19. So what, what, would you, what would you advise as, you know, the extra caution that Kenyans should take? I mean, you see, because of the fact that we've gone through the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave, and people have survived through it, yeah. I mean, people have started becoming lax, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, you go to supermarkets, you'll find people having the masks on but covering their chins, mm -hmm. not their nose or their mouth. Yeah. Um, you'll find people shaking hands, people going for parties. Mm -hmm. Now is not the time to go for this. I humbly appeal to everybody, um, postpone these gatherings. Uh, postpone the weddings or if you want to have a wedding just have it with the immediate family members don't have huge parties or gatherings um, political, just make rallies. political rallies as well is a humble appeal to the government as well mm -hmm. um, we saw what happened in the in India after mm -hmm. the political rallies um, their uh, cases really shot up to more than 400,000 a day mm -hmm. yes yeah. so we don't have the infrastructure in terms of the healthcare to deal with the massive numbers that can come about because of political rallies or gatherings or uh, people not uh, socially distancing themselves. Especially now that the... With the Delta, the Delta variant. variant yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so let, let's, let's, let's shift a bit and move into now your area of speciality, which is kidney. Um, how have you been able to ensure that kidney transplants take place in these COVID-centric times? So, uh, I had the, the transplant unit at the MP Shah Hospital, and uh, when the COVID uh, pandemic started, um, especially when we got our first case in, in Kenya in March last year, we put a hold to transplants basically across the country mm -hmm. because of the fact that we did not know how severe it was going to be for how long it was going to last i mean it was all very new to all of us across the world mm -hmm. so across the country um nairobi eldoret where we do kidney transplants we basically halted our transplant programs mm -hmm. until we saw what was happening and uh, how we were going to deal with it mm -hmm. now we need to remember that patients who are going to be transplanted are going to be on heavy immunosuppression so we t technically suppress the body's immunity to fight 
mm -hmm. and uh, any infections because this is also what helps to protect the foreign, I mean, the new kidney that the, don't, I mean, the recipient has. Mm -hmm. Because if it were not for these immunosuppressant drugs, the mm -hmm. body would reject the mm -hmm. kidney because it is a foreign tissue. Mm -hmm. But it also comes with its own collateral damage because you are predisposed to getting infections as well. That's true. So with the COVID-19 and the way how infectious it was, mm -hmm. we had to put a halt to it. And we know that patients who have comorbidities, patients mm -hmm. who have kidney disease, mm -hmm. patients who have transplanted tend to get more severe disease. Okay. So we had to come up with protocols mm -hmm. and guidelines for our country as to how we can go ahead with the transplant mm -hmm. programs. Program. So when, when, you put, when you put the transplants on hold, you, you, you don't necessarily suspend you know, the urgency of the patient needing Medicare. So what do you do as, 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 a, as, as a mitigating? So um, the patients who require renal replacement therapy, mm -hmm. so there are two forms of renal replacement therapy. One is dialysis mm -hmm. and one is transplant. Of course, transplant is a preferred modality of the renal replacement therapy. Yeah. And I always tell my patients that transplant is never an emergency because we have the stopgap measure of dialysis. Of dialysis. Yes, which basically acts as a surrogate kidney, yeah. Yeah. which uh, cleans out the blood from, I mean, removes all the toxins and balances out your electrolytes and your acid base and everything. Yeah. So for these patients, you basically, who do require transplants, majority of them are already on dialysis. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So they're, they're already stable on okay. dialysis. Okay. So if you delay the transplant, it's not a life and death issue? It normally shouldn't be a life and yeah. death issue. Of yeah. course, we always advocate for transplant as early as possible. Yeah. But we have to weigh the benefit versus the risk. Okay. Okay. Right. So at that point in time, when yeah. the COVID pandemic started, mm. um, a lot of centers across the world halted the transplant program because uh -huh. we needed to know what exactly was happening and how we were going to deal with it. Okay. Because as I said, studies showed that those patients who were transplanted and got COVID, mm -hmm. the outcome was not good. Okay. Yes. All right. So it was prudent to suspend it. Now, in terms of um, post-surgery care, okay, do, do we have adequate human resource, you know, capacity to provide the critical care? Because I know after surgery, there is that very important critical care that is required. So in terms of capacity, do we have those resources? And number two, um, how about the medicines that patients have to take after surgery? Are they reasonably priced here in Kenya and they are they readily available so the answer to your first question about the human resource yes we do have the human resource mm -hmm. and uh, we do have the structures in place the, the critical care units yeah. to take care of our patients post transplant yeah. um, at the MP Shah hospital after the transplant the recipient goes to the critical care unit for very close monitoring for three to four days mm -hmm. Um, they're not on the ventilator or anything, it's just purely for monitoring purposes. Yeah. Um, in terms of personnel, uh, yes, we do have nephrologists mm. who are also trained in transplants as well mm. here in Kenya. Here in Kenya. Yes. Okay. So we do the transplants, we've been doing transplants for a long period of time here in Kenya. Okay. It started off with the Kenyatta National Hospital. Okay. Um, they're still doing their transplants as well. Mpisha Hospital for the past three years has I'm been doing here. transplants as well. Yeah. And. Uh, when it comes to the drugs, yeah. the drugs are available. They're actually readily available, mm -hmm. um, reasonably priced, but it still uh, is prudent to remember that these patients require the drugs for life. For life, okay. Now, initially, for the first one year, every month, the patient has to pay 40,000 Kenyan shillings every month for the drugs. The a lot of money. Yes, it's a lot of money, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at dialysis, mm -hmm. the dialysis costs 76,000 Kenyan shillings every month mm -hmm. for the government, the NHIF to reimburse the hospitals. Mm -hmm. They provide two dialysis sessions every week, okay. amounting to eight sessions a yeah, month. A month, yeah. And they reimburse 9,500, which comes to 76,000. Yeah. So if the NHIF is reimbursing 76,000 a month yeah. to the hospital so the patient doesn't pay anything, yeah. it would be more economical to reimburse for the medications. Mm -hmm. the 40,000. So you're saving 36,000. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of patients, when they're told that they have to pay 40,000 a month for the rest of their life... It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. A lot of patients say that, look, we're getting dialysis for free, so why don't we just remain on dialysis? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. But now, if you look at it, the direct cost savings that happens, mm -hmm. the 36,000 that happens yeah. every month. Yeah. Plus, remember that when somebody is on dialysis, they do it minimum twice a week or three times a week. A week, yeah. 
they spend half of the day in the hospital two or three times a week. Yeah. So they're not at the workplace. So yeah. we are basically losing the GDP no, you're that right. this person will be contributing. So there's the indirect savings as well. Okay. Yes. Now since, since we are doing a bit of maths, why then do we have a number of, a sizable number of Kenyans, for example, traveling to India? When, <laughs> when locally we can have the transplant here? And you've spoken about the mathematics and it sort of makes sense to yeah. me you know to to have it done here w would that be a fair statement so yes um there's a lot of misconception that we don't do transplants here in kenya unfortunately up to now yeah um there's a lot of misconception that yes transplants are being done here but you know they are the very junior doctors who are doing it mm -hmm. that is not true i mean we have very seasoned doctors who are doing the transplant surgeries um their outcomes have been excellent mm. Um, we have done audits as the Kenya Renal Association, who, which is headed by uh, my mentor, Dr. Ahmed Tawahir. Yeah. And we have guidelines in place to help the hospitals who want to start transplant programs as well. Yeah. Uh, we published the national guidelines last year and launched them last year. Yeah. Um, so we, we are doing transplants. We, we have been doing transplants for the past two decades. Mm -hmm. Yes. So okay. Okay. the cost is much cheaper than going abroad. It's much cheaper than going yes. abroad. Yeah. Just repeat that so that I make sure I got you, <laughs> I got you right. The it's cost is much cheaper when you do the transplants here in Kenya. And I'll yeah. give you an example. When you yeah. go to India, for example, yeah. you will travel with four people. Yeah. The donor, the recipient, and then two people for support. For care. Yes. Yeah. So you have to take care of their flights. You have to take care of the accommodation there, mm -hmm. the food. Mm -hmm. There's a cost of the transplant itself. In mm -hmm. India, you're supposed to stay for three months mm -hmm. in India for the transplant. Mm -hmm. The rest of your family can't travel and see you as well because, of course, there's a cost aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do it here, mm -hmm. the cost basically is much less. I mean, we... At the MP Shah Hospital, our cost on average comes to around 1.7 to 1.8 million, which is the total cost of both the donor and the recipient, the surgery, the stay in the hospital for up to 10 days, mm -hmm. which is very reasonable. If you go to India and if you do the maths, it comes to around 2 to 2.5 million. Way above what mm. you'd spent locally. Exactly. Now, 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 you spoke about guidelines, eh? and I just want you to touch a little bit on the regulatory framework that is in place to help donors. Because we have people who are willing to donate, you know, their organs, and then in the last minute, they, they change their minds and say, we were coerced. So how do you ensure that, you know, that, that value chain is seamless? So what happens is, um, like, I'll give an example of the model that we have at MP Shah Hospital. Mm -hmm. We have a transplant committee that consists of your nephrologists, your surgeons, your anesthetists. We also have the counselor, and then separately we have a donor advocate as well. Mm -hmm. So the donor advocate is in no way part of the transplant process itself. Mm -hmm. So he's a totally independent person who now uh, sits with the donor and then explains the risks and benefits and explores any issues that the donor might have. Mm -hmm. So that way then he gives us a report and if he feels that the donor is not ready mm -hmm. in any way, mm -hmm. then we call it off. You call it off. Yes, and he goes for further counseling mm -hmm. until we are fully sure that the donor has not been coerced mm -hmm. or the donor is giving it out of his own free will. Free will. Yes. And that's very important. So, um, c can we get uh, emergency dialysis at any time now that we are living right in the middle of COVID-centric times? So, most of the hospitals work 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, at the MP Shah Hospital, we have started the nighttime dialysis, mm -hmm. meaning that even at night you can get di your dialysis in case if you missed it during the day. The main aim of starting it was basically because of uh, the, the people who are working. Okay, or if you are taking care of a patient who is on dialysis and you are in the working class group, mm. so we don't want you to miss your work, mm -hmm. or we don't want the patient to miss his or her work as well. So we have started this nighttime dialysis, which runs from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. the following day. Now, even for emergency dialysis, as long as you're stable, you can be dialyzed at no extra costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is just covered under, under the NHIF as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, for so the NHIF plays a very important role. It plays a vital role, and, I'm, and I just want to thank the government for their initiative for the NHIF, because I used to see before the NHIF came in, mm -hmm. people would be selling land to get their loved ones onto dialysis. It and was expensive. It's very expensive. And today NHIF is sorting that out? NHIF is sorting it out. You just mm -hmm. have to pay 500 shillings a month. Mm -hmm. I would appeal humbly to all the citizens, please pay up, mm -hmm. because you never know when... <laughs> you will require it. Trust me. <laughs> yes. So it's working for you. <laughs> the NHIF. The NHIF. Especially is for your patients. For my patients, because remember, nine thousand five hundred mm -hmm. 
twice a week in a month is 76,000 mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Wow. Unless you get transplanted. Okay, so we're coming uh, to the close of this interview. Um, what, what, would, what, 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 are the, what are the signs of kidney problems? That's a very important question. I keep on getting asked that. Unfortunately, until you are in the extremes, you don't get the signs or symptoms of kidney disease. Mm. When you are in the extremes, you will come with swollen legs, swollen face, you are vomiting, you are not passing urine, you mm. can't breathe because the fluid is accumulating in the lungs. But up to stage four, you might just feel a bit tired and you will attribute it to working hard. Lethargy, Lethargy yes. hard work and so on exactly. and so forth. Yes. So it's very difficult to tell the early days of exactly. kidney so complication. If you are at risk, now yeah. who are the people who are at risk? It's yeah. those people who have diabetes, uh -huh. who have high blood pressure, uh -huh. a family history of kidney disease, then they need to be concerned and worried if they, get, if they feel tired, if they find that the legs are getting swollen. So what swollen. do they do? Do they come forward for some they tests They need to come for tests. The only yeah. way you can know is mm. by doing a blood test, the uh -huh. kidney function test. That's the only way you can know. That's an important one. It's very important. So as your closing remarks, I know the African Association of Nephrologists was headed by the late Dr. Anthony Judware Omolo. And he had started something. So I'm wondering what, and, and, and Pole, for, for your loss, because I know he was important and a very important resource for you. So what, 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 what he started, what are you doing to build on it? So Professor Were was a mentor to me and to many of the young nephrologists. Um, his uh, passing away was a, bi a big shock to the fraternity, nephrology fraternity, and to the population at large as well because he was a brilliant man. Mm. Um, his vision was to have the African Association of Nephrology opening up collaborations between the African countries mm. and to help build um, a, a working network mm -hmm. okay, among the African countries to see how we can improve our human resources, how we can improve our delivery of nephrology services to every African country. Mm -hmm. That was his dream. That was a big vision. Yes. Yeah. And uh, from the tributes that poured in last year, um, everybody respected the great man. Mm -hmm. And currently, um, we are all part of the committees that he had started off with. So we have the transplantation committee for which I am part of. There's a dialysis committee. Mm -hmm. So we are all working together to gather data to see which countries require our support mm -hmm. in terms of uh, helping, in, in terms of the technical know-how yeah. uh, in improving our nephrology services and building more collaboration between the African countries. And that's a good place to end the interview. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dr. Hussein Bagba. Thank Baga, you. Yes. Baga, thank you for coming through. Thank you so much. All right, mm -hmm. we're going to take a short